Welcome to the first session of International Education's Spring Virtual Speaker Series, Explore the World. My name is Jeanette Jasperson, and it's my pleasure to be your host today, your monitor. I am a coordinator in the International Education Office. During this time that we can't travel, we are exploring places and topics that are critical to the well being of our planet. Resolving disagreements without resorting to violence is a critical issue in every nation and between nations. Consequently, the International Education Office has led a peace building initiative in the Kansas City area for many years. Every fall, we co sponsor the Greater Kansas City Peace Building Conference with the Center for Global Peace Journalism at Park University. And in the spring, we host one off peace building events on campus. Today's session is the first of our spring peace building events. When we were planning for spring, we asked ourselves, what is one very basic skill which each one of us needs if we are going to live in a peaceful society? And we concluded that the ability to have a conversation with people with whom we disagree was a very critical basic skill. We approached Dr. Terry Easley Geraldo, Professor of Communication Studies, to ask for her advice on how to approach this topic, and we learned serendipitously that this topic is a research focus for her sabbatical this spring. Dr. Terry Easley Geraldo has taught at JCCC for 16 years. Her teaching and her research focus on debate, intercultural communication, gender, leadership, public speaking, and public communication. During her time at JCCC, she has coached the 2010 and 2011 National Community College Debate Champions and has been awarded teaching, publication, and service awards. We are so pleased to be able to host her on this series and to learn from her today. If you have questions at any time, please type them into the chat and Terry will address them at the end of the session. So now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Terry Easley Geraldo to this session. Awesome. Thank you, Jeanette. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. It's great to see so many family, friends, and colleagues. Um, I haven't seen people in quite a while, so it's good to see you uh, here on the screen. Before we get started, I just want to give you a little bit of my background of communication studies, which informs how I approach this presentation today. So as Jeanette said, I spent a good portion of my life, 16 years in competitive debate, both as a debater and then a debate coach. I like to joke with my husband that I'm a professional debater, so he shouldn't argue with me, but uh, he doesn't always listen to that advice. Um, but a lot of my training is in persuasion and argumentation. My PhD focused on political communication. So of course, I've seen a lot of debates, a lot of arguments, and a lot of polarization, which leads us to this topic today. For those of you who teach at Johnson County Community College, I, this is my sabbatical project, and there will be many more materials coming out at the end of the semester related to civil conversations in the classroom and how we can have productive disagreements. So today I'm not going to teach you how to win arguments. That's a topic for another day, but we're going to focus on acknowledging when and how we can have productive disagreements. Um, so a couple disclaimers. This is going to be interactive. I have some poll questions I'll be asking you throughout. I have you in, enter stuff in the chat, so hopefully we can be as interactive as we can on Zoom with a large group. Um, and I use lots of images. As someone who teaches PowerPoint, I don't like when people have lots of text on the slides, so I use lots of images. Thanks, Google Images, for livening up the presentation. So let's get started. And the first thing I want to ask you is, are you a conflict avoider, a conflict initiator, or somewhere in the middle? I'm going to put in the chat a poll everywhere link. And in that you will click on it and you will answer this question. This link will be the same one we use for the whole talk today. So just kind of copy it and you'll continue to paste it in the browser for the series of questions. So do you avoid conflict? Are you one who is not afraid of conflict who will bring it up to um, someone or are you somewhere in the middle? It kind of depends on the topic. So I'll give everyone a moment to get that going. And if you'll do it on the poll everywhere, that way we can all see the results here. Yeah. 
this is all the way back. All right, wow. Okay, so we have a lot of conflict avoiders in our group, which we'll talk about. And then we have a lot of people who are somewhere in the middle. Maybe sometimes you feel comfortable um, giving or bringing up conflict and sometimes you don't. So it could depend on the situation. So definitely awesome. Okay, so as we're going to jump back in here, technology, you know, jumping back and forth between the, the various slides is fun. All right, so first we're gonna start with frame of reference. And what this means for communication is that it is an important concept that we think of when we think about communication and conflict. It's our knowledge, experience, and values that make us who we are. I like this image because it does a good job of showing how you see something really depends on where you're at. My perspective differs from your perspective. Our lives, our culture, all of that influences it. And so it's really important to keep that in mind as we think about uh, disagreement. The next thing I wanna talk about is culture. It's often hard to describe, but it is the driving force for why we do think and believe what we do. And this usually makes up a huge portion of our frame of reference. And culture, I like the metaphor of it being like a lens in which we view the world. So my lens prescription is gonna be different than yours and your lens description will be different from your best friend. Do you think any two people can ever have the same frame of reference? I see some nods, heads yes, heads no. Not all the time. Right, the answer is no. You may have frames of reference and people who are very similar, but no two people are going to have the exact same frame of reference because they're not gonna have the same experiences the same values, all of those things to sync up. So every person's gonna have their own set of lenses in which they look at the world. And the last thing I wanna talk about is culture and the iceberg. As we think of our frame of reference and what we know about somebody that we're engaging with, culture is like an iceberg. And about 20% of it is above the water. It's visible, it's things we can see, things they talk about, they wear, they do. We can observe that behavior. But a good 80% of a person's culture and the why and how they feel about certain things is under the water. Meaning that when we engage with someone, a lot of the times, especially in disagreements, we're not fully going to understand all of that that's below the surface, all of the why and how and those deeply held values. So it's really important to remember that we only see a sliver of that person. And so a lot of what gets us into disagreements is all the stuff that's under the water. In this age of divisiveness, it's very clear that we're more polarized than ever. I didn't need to provide any statistics for you. I think we're all really aware that we're extremely polarized right now. Simple things turn into huge arguments and it's amplified by being in a global pandemic. So it's important for us to take a step back and think about how we can engage with others that don't agree with us. Our strong communication skills are more important than ever before. And the ability to have civil conversations and thoughtful disagreements is crucial to a, a civil society. Adam Grant wrote in the New York Times, quote, if no one ever argues, you're not likely to give up your old ways of thinking, let alone try new ones. Disagreement is the antidote to groupthink. We're at our most imaginative when we're out of sync. There's no better time than childhood to learn how to dish it out and how to take it, end quote. We all may be a bit beyond our childhood years, but it's never too late to learn. And luckily, for us, we can learn how to argue and we can learn how to recognize productive disagreements. I ran across this image during election season where I was busy unfriending and unfollowing lots of people on Facebook. Um, certain things I just couldn't take any more of. And I thought this was like an aha moment. We must learn to talk to one another and more important, listen to one another. We must learn to talk to people we disagree with because you can't unfriend everyone in real life. So sadly, we don't have the mute button or the unfollow button in real life. So it's important for us to acknowledge disagreements are gonna happen and what we can do to navigate those. And this is where I wanna stop for a second and point out there's a huge difference between where communication takes place. So the medium of where it takes place. So having a conversation in person is very different than having a conversation on social media or via text. Communication scholars, myself included, are gonna tell you, you always usually want to have conflict in person. That way you can see the whole communication experience. I can see the nonverbals. I can hear the tone in the voice. I can see their facial expressions. And that gives the whole picture of communication. When you're just texting or you're the keyboard warrior on Facebook, 
you're missing a lot of that contextual information that you have in a face-to-face -face setting. So just kind of want to take a moment to pause that it's very important of where you're having that communication. And we'll talk about that as well. Luke Winslow, a, an assistant professor of communication at Baylor University, uh, points out that civil discourse is grounded in, um, we've lost humility, basically. He says, quote, civil discourse is grounded in the idea that I don't know all there is to know. I know something, but I don't know it all. And I could very well be wrong. One of the things that plagues our public conversations now is this arrogance or lack of humility. I know everything there is to know, therefore I don't need to listen to you in any civil manner. I really like Dr. Winslow's comments here because I think he hits the nail on the head with we've lost kind of that humility. We think we know everything there is to know. We think we're right. Google tells us everything we need to know and we sometimes lose the track of, well, there are two sides to many issues. And so being aware of that. So now we're gonna be interactive again. Those of you who joined us a little bit later, I'm posting a poll everywhere link in the chat. And I'm gonna ask you what topics we activate the question. What topics do you get into disagreements about the most? And this is open-ended. So type in as many as you can that you can think of in the next couple moments. So go to that poll everywhere link, click on it and enter as many as you can think of. What types of things are you getting into disagreements? And if you can do it on that poll everywhere link, that will be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we give you a couple more minutes to do that. And here's what we got. Politics, not surprised that that is the number one. And we can see it's moving. Y'all are a lot of interesting things here. Religion, we see environment, money, mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. A lot of very interesting children. A lot of things here. Very good coronavirus relationships. So we can see there's a whole much, a, a lot of topics and politics and religion. Those are the two things I know growing up, my parents always said, we don't talk about politics and religion. Like we don't do it because you're gonna get into trouble. Um, so we can see that those are things that um, definitely are areas where we can have different of, of, of opinions. Awesome. So the next thing I wanna talk about is Buster Benson has a book called Why Are We Yelling? And this is a really great book. Um, it's an easy read and he really dives into certain issues that we have. And he makes a, this comparison of arguments to weeds. And he says that they sprout in our gardens and minds. We usually don't want them in either place. They're annoying and mortal enemies at worst. Many of us approach disagreements in the same way, as things to battle and destroy. And so I like this metaphor as well because sometimes weeds pop up and they're annoying. I think they're annoying all the time. My husband finds this weird enjoyment in picking them. So, you know, they pop up and I deal with them and then they come back. And that's the same for arguments, which we'll talk about as well. So here we go with another um, interactive activity. I have three statements here. One is arguments are bad. Two, arguments change minds. And three, arguments end. I would like you to go to the poll everywhere trying to navigate all the technology here. The link's there again for you. And choose which one do you identify with the most in terms of how you feel with arguments. Do you think arguments are bad, arguments change minds, or arguments end? And I'll give you a few moments. Oh, can you see that? Here we go. All right, awesome. So we have a lot, a pretty a close tie with arguments change minds and arguments end. Not a whole, a couple with arguments are bad as well. So good. It's usually pretty spread out depending on your perspective of what you, how you feel about arguments. So these are misconceptions about arguments. 
um, Buster Benson identifies that these are three common misconceptions about arguments. And we're gonna walk through each of these misconceptions, which are gonna help us understand how we can approach arguments. The first is that arguments end, or that arguments are bad. Conflict is a necessary and natural part of any relationship. Dr. John Gottman says that a relationship without conflict is a relationship without communication and is bound to fail. Conflict's inevitable because anytime we put two or more people together that have different perspectives, those aren't always gonna match up. And so disagreements are a sign that the relationship is healthy. No, no. Gottman recommends that we have a five to one ratio of positive to negative encounters. This ensures the flow of disagreements is kept open and it can be resolved without being overwhelmingly negative. So if you will see the first image, you'll see that a bunch of happy faces, right? A lot of positive encounters. And that doesn't really allow for the relationship to grow. There's no challenges to the relationship. So there's a, just a lot of positive and there's nothing there to challenge it. The middle image is the ideal five to one ratio where we have several positive encounters which help us navigate that one negative encounter. And when we have negative encounters, when we have so many positive ones to surround us with, it helps us navigate and get through that negative encounter because we can lean on all those positive encounters. The last image you'll see has many negative encounters. And this is one that's usually bound to fail because you have more negative encounters than positive encounters in your relationship. And so you don't have much positive to lean on, meaning usually the relationship fails, you dissolve it, it fizzles, but it doesn't really survive or is not as healthy as one that would have the five to one ratio. And another big problem we have is people just aren't really taught how to argue. I've always said, I think everyone should take an argumentation and debate class because it helps you analyze things and think critically about certain issues and take constructive criticism and not feel like everybody's always attacking you if they don't agree with you. So how we argue matters, and luckily that's a solvable problem, and hopefully you'll get a couple of skills today. So this image I like because I think it really encompasses our um, conflict avoiders. It can do a lot of damage if disagreements, um, if you ignore them rather than let them surface, and we'll talk about that. Kim Scott is the author of Radical Candor, and she calls the conflict avoider and the impulse that we have towards being kindness, like we don't want to have conflict because we want to be kind and keep the, the peace. She calls this ruinous empathy because it actually causes more problems than it solves. She says this is a real thing that takes hold in our lives, our jobs, and ourselves. We see this all the time. And it happens when people feel a lot about things, but for whatever cultural or personality-based reasons, they feel it's not best to challenge them directly. I don't want that person to be mad at me. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to have any kind of consequence to that, right? So I really like this illustration because you can probably easily identify where you may fall. And if you think about certain arguments, you may fall in different categories. I know I, when I think of certain topics, I'm like, whoop, I'm obnoxious aggression when it comes to certain topics. But we want to really strive for that radical candor, which allows for challenges, it allows for growth and change. And radical candor is the ability to challenge directly and also at the same time to show that you care about that person, which we would say is constructive criticism too. So you're able to speak freely and you're able to show that you do care for that person and still have a relationship even though you may not agree with them. If you look at the other categories, you'll notice that there's little to no change. If we look at ruinous empathy or manipulative insecurity or obnoxious aggression, those categories do not allow for any kind of change to happen. And the reason that we use productive versus unproductive arguments instead of good or bad is it's a more accurate way to analyze the variety of arguments. If we get into arguments and we come away with a better understanding of the argument, a better plan of what to do next, not only are we canceling out those negative emotions, but it turns them into positive ones too. And with these categories, we can ask better questions. We can say, what makes my arguments productive? How can I make my arguments more productive? And is this an unproductive argument? And recognizing when you're in an unproductive argument and getting out of it, saying, this is not a situation that's going to be productive for anybody. We should just end this. That is a really good skill to have because it can help you salvage relationship. So we can really only change two things. Sorry for my Marco Rubio moment. Um, our minds and our behavior. So many people agree, think that arguments can change minds. 
But disagreements happen because there's usually fundamentally unacceptable differences. I'll say that again. Disagreements happen because there's fundamentally unacceptable differences between perspectives, and we find them everywhere. In the word cloud that we just did, you saw that there's all kinds of topics relating to money, children, religion, politics, the virus, all kinds of things that we have disagreements about because we have different perspectives on the issue. And it's easy for us to see a disagreement and think, well, the easy route is to simply change the person's mind. You're wrong, I'm right. If I change you, aha, we're done, right? But that's not the way to do it. Because we have those unacceptable differences, we start to get into a clash immediately and we think we have to conquer the other side and we have to change their minds. And that's where all the trouble starts with disagreements. And we have to really realize that we can't always do that. Sometimes our attempts to change the other minds can have the opposite effect and have people really dig their heels even deeper into the issue that they stand. You've probably had a friend or a relative where you can think this, this happened, right? I can think of conversations where I was talking to the person, they just dug their, he their heels deeper and deeper and there was no moving whatsoever um, from that. And this is called the backfire effect. So trying to persuade someone too much can backfire. They can say, I've just, I've had enough. And then it just causes them to get more and more entrenched within whatever that belief or value is that they have. And this happens when we, we think it's an unacceptable demand on our freedom. We see this with lots of examples during the pandemic from the mass debate to business restrictions and the government lockdown. When you see the two sides kind of having discussions, you'll see that people just start to dig in and then it could have the, the backfire effect. And when we think about changing minds, we think about the mind as a boulder, right? Some people do and think I can just push the boulder over to the other side and poof, my argument is done and I've won. Well, unfortunately, that's not really the way that it works. Buster Benson says that a mind's more like a pile of lots of little rocks rather than a, a big boulder. And to change a mind, we have to take little rocks from one pile to another, little at a time, maybe one at a time, maybe two or three at a time, maybe a handful at a time. But we can't just make one radical shift over. And that's because our brains do not know how to rewire a full belief in one big haul. It just doesn't happen. Our new neuron paths aren't created that quickly. So you could get a tiny percent of someone's mind to change, but, and they could rewire a little tiny part of a belief, but minds change slowly over time. So it's the picking up of many little rocks and moving them over rather than just pushing a giant boulder. And the third misconception is that arguments end. Remember the weed metaphor that we talked about earlier? Well, arguments have deep roots and will always find a way to grow back again. For some of us, the arguments don't seem so bad. They're easy to work around. They pop up, you deal with them and you go on. But others can be really ugly and tiresome where you go nuclear on them and that part of the yard is abandoned and is a scorched earth kind of area that you don't go to for a long time. But either way, the weeds usually come back and despite our attempts to get rid of them. And that's true of both arguments that we have and it's also true of arguments that we don't have. So just because we don't have an argument doesn't mean it's not gonna keep popping up and that's why we have to acknowledge and kind of confront them. So arguments may disappear from the surface, but they're gonna kind of keep popping up. And we want to think about, sometimes we have to bridge the gap and deal with it because we know it's not gonna go away. So sometimes that involves compromise or acknowledging certain things to make the relationship be able to work, even though you don't agree. And this isn't a news flash or any sort of shocking news to anyone, but anxiety triggers disagreements. Our anxiety sparks when our perspectives that we value bump into other ones that challenge it. And if we find this new one to be unacceptable, then our someone's wrong, I must change them mindset kind of pops in and we leap into action to try to change their mind. This is where I find myself in trouble on social media. I'll see something and someone's just saying a fact that I know is not true or I think it's not true because I have lots of evidence on the other side. And I'm like, I need to fix them and give them the right information. And so this is a, a, an area where my anxiety is when people cite misinformation or don't have the full facts. And so we have to be mindful of that. Um, when our anxiety sparks, that's kind of a sign that a disagreement is on the horizon and it's coming. Anxiety doesn't have to lead to disagreement, but it does a lot because we have competing anxieties over various things, which means that it's important to acknowledge what your anxiety is about an issue. So when you are talking to someone, 
you verbalize what your anxiety is about that issue and then ask them what theirs is as well. Because you could have different anxieties about the same issue, which means that your approach to it is completely different. You have different motivations. You have a different reason. You're looking at it from a different perspective because of those anxieties. And a lot of times, once you identify those, then you can have a moment where you're like, ah, okay, now I see why you think that because this is bothering you for this reason. And so if we can identify those anxieties, a lot of times that really gives more information to the situation you're in. Which leads us to identifying the realms of where disagreement lies. Benson gives a really good suggestion of orienting ourselves to have a more productive disagreement is to remember to ask the person, is this about what's true, what's meaningful, or what's useful? And this lets you figure out if it's about the head, the heart, or the hand. And if you both agree on it, awesome, you're on your way. If you don't agree about what realm it's in, well, you've got some work to do to figure that out. When we're having disagreements, it's very useful to figure out what realm it's in because each realm has its own rules for validation and implication of the conversation. So what you do to resolve a disagreement in one realm won't always work in the other realm. So you really have to identify where is the disagreement? Where is it happening? The first one is the head realm. And this is anxiety about what's true. This is information and science. Disagreements can be settled with information because it's usually about data and evidence and it can be objectively verified as true or false. Now here's where I have to pause again and say, given our current state of affairs here in the US, I do have to point out that this is a little bit more tricky than it used to be. Um, it can get more complicated because we like to, we see now that more people are arguing about what's actually true. And we also see things like fake news and claims of that as well. So what used to be really simple, like, hey, it's about the evidence, true facts. Now we're debating about what's true. No, I have evidence that says this. No, I have evidence that says that. And so now it is a little bit more complicated than it, it used to be. But basically it's concerned with the what of a situation. So questions that we would ask ourselves for this realm are, is there a source of information we both can agree on? And so that's the first, trying to find what your information is that you both can agree on as you start to talk about the issue. And then another question you can ask is, what qualifies as a trustworthy source? So that's where a lot of disagreement comes and we start to see that people are on different sides because of what they view as trustworthy or what they view as a valid source. And so if you ask each other, what is a trustworthy source that will give you a starting ground to have that conversation. The heart realm deals with the anxiety of what's meaningful. And this is our preferences and our values. And this is personal taste because it's what you determine yourself. So what do I value? Um, what is meaningful to me? And this is the why of a situation. So when you're in this realm, you can ask yourself, why is this important to us? Why is it important to me? Why is it important to you? You can also ask yourself, what past experiences led us to having those preferences or values? And that's that frame of reference we talked about earlier. So what past experiences have caused you or has justified you in having these preferences or values? And lastly, the hands realm deals with anxiety about what's useful. This is the practicality and planning of a situation. So when a disagreement can be settled with a form of test or seeing how things go in the future, that would be in this realm. And when you're in this realm, you can ask yourself, what would happen if we didn't do anything? So if we didn't do anything, what would the implica implications of that be? And you can also ask yourself, how confident are we in the outcome of those different proposed actions? So if you're, if you're evaluating multiple policies, which one, how confident are we that it's going to produce the results we want and measure those between the various ones that you have? So what happens if a disagreement is in all three realms? Disagreements will always occur in one of these realms, and, but you can see there be a blend of two or even three of them at the same time. So of course that does complicate things, right? Which means that what you think is a simple argument actually has multiple layers. And what's helpful is to say, what's this about? And to parcel out those various different parts of the argument to say, this is the head realm, this is the heart, and this is the hand. And that allows you to address it. Maybe you can resolve one of them. Maybe you both can agree on the head part, but you're just not gonna agree on the heart or the hand. Or maybe you agree on the hand, but you're not gonna agree on the other ones, right? So parceling it out helps you identify, and maybe it can help you resolve portions of it. And that is useful in a disagreement. 
So now I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put the poll everywhere um, up again. It's activated. Is which one do you find yourself getting into the most often? What realm? Are they about what's true, what's meaningful, or what's useful? So if you'll go to that poll everywhere and enter whether you get into ones about truth, meaningfulness, or usefulness, hand, heart, or uh, head, sorry. <laughs> right? Awesome. Interesting. So we see, does everyone see the results here? Oh, here we go. So we can see that we are mostly head and heart, which is usually pretty much, people tend to be head and heart is usually pretty, pretty split. So not surprising here. And hand tends to be, um, for most people, the least realm that they, they get into. Awesome. Great. So if we think about polarization, this occurs when every side's holding strong opinions about the unacceptability of the other stance. The key here is trying not to demonize the other side. And we have a tendency to do that when we don't agree with the other side, we'll say, well, they're just wrong or they're this or that or whatever. And we really want to try not to do that automatic tendency to just demonize the other side. It's important to use our internal voices to try to figure that out but also to recognize what stereotypes and biases that we're holding that cause us to want to have those reactions. So empathy is a really important thing. Um, you wanna establish a foundation of respect and you want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Assume they're being honest, assume they have good intentions. And that's a really big one is sometimes when we disagree with someone, we assume their intentions are bad and we jump to that conclusion. And it's not a lot of the times wrong, that they have good intentions, they just are using different perspectives. So be curious to ask questions so that you can understand the other uh, perspectives. Even if you disagree completely, hopefully you could understand a little bit more. Biases alter our judgment, and this is where we usually get into disagreement, is due to biases. But biases are here to stay because they're fundamental to how we think, right? We have biases, they're mental shortcuts, that allow us to process information, to deal with information overload and uncertainty. They help us orient ourselves and kind of give us that way to process. There's over 200 different cognitive uh, biases, so I'm not gonna get into all of those, but it's really important that we accept and appreciate those biases and we're aware of them and we rely on others to help us fill in parts that we don't know. So we wanna develop what we call honest bias. And this is accepting our own limitations and remaining open of our blind spots. So acknowledging that I can see what I perceive to be what I want to see, right? But I do have blind spots that others could fill in for me. It's kind of like the car sensors that you have that tell you that someone's in your blind spot. That's what you can rely on others to help fill in information that you may not have. So instead of immediately thinking that the other person's wrong, you can ask yourself, what am I missing? And if you ask, what am I missing? Or ask the other person, well, what am I missing? That allows them the opportunity to maybe fill in that blind spot that you don't have. And instead of getting angry and frustrated, which I know is kind of my first tendency, get curious. So ask questions rather than to get angry, uh, try to ask questions of the other person so you can understand where they're coming from. Confirmation bias is the tendency to look for information that supports how we feel about something. So this happens when we form an opinion and then we look for evidence to support it and we discard, disregard anything that contradicts it. And this results in a really dangerous feedback loop that confirms our bias. And we see this a lot on social media. This happens a lot in social media when you kind of choose your circles and Twitter and things like that. Um, the Upshot wrote about this and said, confirmation bias may be the reason our political debates remain intractable. After all, as you accumulate more evidence confirming your views, you're less likely to question them and less likely to change your mind. As members of competing political tribes collect more evidence in favor of their favored views, their opinions harden and each tribe becomes more convinced of their correctness. So what's the solution to that? Carl Richards wrote in the New York Times, 
quote, the only solution I see is to purposely expose yourself to views that don't match yours. In an echo of many of the other ideas, he suggests purposely seeking out views from the other side, whether that's websites, books, radio, television, or conversations with people on the other side. And he says it's not just enough to seek them out. He says to listen and to understand, see if you can get to the point where you can honestly say, I understand the argument and I can see why they feel that way. And I'm gonna repeat that again, because I think that's really the goal of a productive disagreement is to say, I understand the argument and I can see why they feel that way. You might not agree with them. You could say, I see the argument and disagree with them, but I can see why they feel that way. So things can go off the rails really quickly. And I see this a lot when I'm having class discussions, when people stop speaking from their own perspective and they try to speculate on others' perspectives. So we should try to use I feel statements to articulate our beliefs and perspectives. So I feel this, or I think this, I believe this. And do not use you are, or the worst one would be you feel, right? That's when we try to speculate how someone is feeling about, or you think about something. And most importantly, we try to invite others to represent their own perspective. So you can seek to understand. That kind of is the theme here, is trying to understand where the other person is coming from. You may not agree, and that's okay, but hopefully you walk away with more understanding. A benefit is, of this is we, when we rely on people to represent themselves, we avoid group stereotypes, and that's really good for a host of reasons, but we allow others to speak for themselves and to represent themselves. Great questions invite great answers, and the best answers surprise us and reveal something that we don't know. Asking a good question forces us to go to the perimeter of what we know and then ask a question of something we do not know. In debate, we were always trained to predict questions, and I would ask a question I knew the answer to because I could trap the person and say, aha, I knew you were going to say that, right? But that's not a good for a productive disagreement. You want to approach it from the perspective that you're trying to seek information to get to a growth mindset where you're trying to learn more about something that you maybe did not know. Get insights that you didn't have before. In his book, Benson gives example of ghosts and talking about whether ghosts are real. Rather than asking the question, do you think ghosts are real, which doesn't reveal a lot of information, right? Yeah. You say yes, no, maybe so. The better question to ask is what experiences have led to your current beliefs about ghosts? This goes back to that frame of reference we talked about earlier, right? All these things that you likely don't know about something, the things that are below the surface of the water and the iceberg, and that greatly influences their perspective. And now you understand why they feel about ghosts the way that they do. It's pretty obvious that listening is important in communication. It's one of the most basic things about communication is listening and trying to understand and comprehend. The surprising answers help us get beyond our normal triggers where we listen to refute. Um, that's kind of our automatic tendency. We hear something and we're automatically trying to figure out how to respond to it. Krista Tippett, the author of Becoming Wise and the host of On Being, a radio show and podcast says, generous listening is powered by curiosity, a virtue we can invite and nurture in ourselves to render it instinctive. It involves a kind of vulnerability, a willingness to be surprised, to let go of assumptions and to take in ambiguity. The listener wants to understand the humanity behind the words of the other and patiently summons one's own best self and one's best words and questions. So basically, rather than listening to dispute, which is kind of our common reaction, we listen generously to try to fully understand. And again, we try to put our biases aside and really listen so we understand where the other person is coming from. Vincent also articulates that there's three really important things we should do about the spaces that we enter disagreements into. The first is ideas. We should be able to allow different ideas and perspectives. We should ask ourselves, is this space allow, encourage, or discourage diverse perspectives from being shared? What voices are welcome in this space? And does it have any preference for issues of the head, the heart, or hand? So being mindful of the ideas that are allowed in that space. The second would be the people. We should permit people to join and leave the conversation freely. Um, allow them to enter and exit of their own free will and ask, are there any consequences uh, or restrictions on who could enter and leave the conversation or this space? And then the last one is culture. We should leave room for the space's culture and to evolve as the disagreement occurs and ask, are there any biases that would favor or disfavor a certain participant or ideas? So being mindful of those 
things as we think about the spaces in which disagreements occur is very important. So some other tips are beginning with respect. Every single conversation must begin in a replace of mutual respect. And you establish this at the very beginning before you get into the discussion. You could say something like, I respect you as a parent, friend, student, teacher, brother, etc." And if you can't find a respectful common ground, then you probably shouldn't begin the conversation. You should be able to start a conversation with some kind of respect so that you can get to a place of understanding. The second is to be mindful of tone and nonverbal cues. This is where it goes back to when I said you should have conversations in person if there's going to be disagreement and not have them virtually or via text or email because you're missing a lot of the nonverbal cues. So you want to be mindful of the tone of your voice, but also your nonverbal. So if someone's talking to me and I'm rolling my eyes and I'm really disinterested, then you're not setting a good example that you're listening and you're doing that generous listening. So being mindful of that. And the last is to be okay with being wrong. Um, we're a very risk averse society that we don't like to admit and we're uncomfortable being wrong, but usually we find ourselves in difficult positions and disagreements. We might misremember something, we might contradict ourselves, we could change our mind midway in a sentence. And so being comfortable to say, okay, I was wrong is really important. Done well, arguments are opportunities. A productive disagreement can be something you look forward to rather than dreading, and it can lead to a mutually beneficial outcome for everyone. Those misconceptions about arguments that we discussed at the beginning, Benson identifies them at the end of his book as gifts of disagreement. The first one that arguments aren't bad, they are signposts to issues that need our attention. So arguments happen because it's an issue that we need to discuss, it's something we need to work out, and that's where our conflict avoiders have a hard time because they don't really want to address it, right? But it's something that needs to be addressed. The second would be arguments aren't about changing minds. They're about bringing minds together. So again, we kind of have, when we see someone that's different from us, we think, well, I've got to change that. But rather than doing that, if we come from a, a standpoint of understanding and trying to understand the other side, then we're bringing minds together. And the last is that arguments don't end. They have deep roots and will pop back up again and again, asking us to engage with them. That's that weed metaphor. They're just gonna keep coming and sometimes they'll pop up quickly, sometimes they'll linger, but they're gonna continuously be there. So at the end of the day, you may not agree with the other person. You might not have changed their mind at all, but that's okay. And hopefully this has helped you see that there's more to disagreement than just who's right and who's wrong. And you can approach disagreements from a position of curiosity and realize that there's more to it. You won't always agree, and that's okay, but if you approach it as opportunities for information rather than cage matches, you're more likely to walk away with new knowledge and understanding of the person. Again, you may walk away still disagreeing and thinking they're completely wrong, and that's okay, but hopefully you will have learned something in the process and learned something new to help fully give yourself the information. So that's all I have for today. We are going to now do some questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see all of you. And I encourage you to type your questions in the chat and Terry will take them. And while you're all thinking and typing, um, I wanted to just start Terry kind of with back to the political question since that was the huge big word in, in the word um, cloud. If you were invited to give advice to Congress, couple of minutes, <laughs> on how they can work together for good for our country. What advice would you give them? That's a great question, Jeanette. I think a lot of times they're not listening to the other side or not listening to the motivation and the reason. They just think that their side's right. And so I think a better approach would be to understand the why, right? To get to that heart realm, the, what's meaningful to them. A lot of that is where the, a lot of the clash happens in, in politics. And so I think rather if they were asking better questions rather than just asserting their right, uh, we would be in a much better place. And I, I think we don't ask questions a lot in politics, mm -hmm. especially in forms of government. We just assert we're the right ones and we keep having that argument, but we're not asking questions as much. And I think that would be a more productive way, hopefully to get things accomplished. Wouldn't that be awesome to have a Congress that would invite Terry to give them that advice? <laughs> 
Um, here's the question. How do you move from an argument um, if the issue is of, of about truth and the people really can't even agree on what the objective fact is? Yeah, so this is one I find myself in a lot, um, as I mentioned, with politics and elections and everything going on these days. You know, you try your best to to try to get to that, but then sometimes if you realize it's not going to go anywhere and you just can't get it to say, OK, mm -hmm. we're just going to disagree on this. Um, I've had to do that with a lot of family members and um, they have differing opinions uh, of what the facts are. And I don't think that that's right. So sometimes it's just simply saying, OK, we're not going to it's not we're not we're not going to agree. Um, maybe we should just, you know, agree to disagree and kind of walk away from it. And I think people are afraid to do that sometimes. I do that quite frequently. And I'll say, well, okay, we're just going to agree to disagree. And uh, a lot of people count that as, well, she's a debater. She's going to disagree about everything. But sometimes you just have to acknowledge that you're not going to make any productive moves on it. And you just do the best you can. Hopefully that, that help answer, Diane. Well, I was going to ask you that kind of that same question, Terry. What about if it's not just a question of fact, but a question of really, really deeply held values? And we could go through all kinds of different examples, but it feels like um, a great deal of the polarization in our society is very different perspectives. How would you address that? So I think it goes back to the questions, right? Is understanding why do they feel that way? So what's caused them to feel that way? So asking the questions of like, what experiences have led you to feel this way? Or why do you feel this way? In a, in a way that's not just explain to me, regurgitate the reasons, but to really understand why they feel that way. And again, you'll walk away maybe not agreeing, um, but you'll understand why they feel that way. And that, that gives you a new perspective and usually changes the way you view them. Like you don't demonize them. Like we talked about earlier, you're not like they're a terrible person. You're like, okay, well, they feel that way because of this. And then you can rationalize it a little bit better. And so you still disagree, but you may just see them in a different way because of the information you gathered from them. Yeah, I think that has helped. Um, Emily wants to know, do you think what type of disagreement is easier to have productively than others, like the head or the heart? Is one of them easier or one of them more difficult? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think I used to think that issues of the head were the easier ones to have, but um, I'm finding these days that that's not really true um, because, you know, five, five or more years ago, you would say, it would be really easy to say, like, these are the facts, the facts are the facts. And that's just mm -hmm. not where we are now. We have people who question mm -hmm. facts from different standpoints. So I think I used to say that the, the head would be the easiest ones. But now I think that actually the heart is because I think if you approach it with questions and you're asking them the questions that get you to understand, then you can have a disagreement, but that changes the way you view them, right? If you're able to understand why they feel the way they feel, even though you may a thousand percent disagree with them, you can at least still have a relationship with them and understand why they feel that way. So I guess I would probably end up saying the heart, but I would used to say hmm. the head because, you know, as a debater, it's like facts are facts, evidence is evidence, um, but it's harder right now to, to do that. It is harder right now to do that. What advice do you have for us, Terry, on dealing with our social media feeds? So I don't know if I have the best advice because I, I uh, you know, would find myself unfollowing and unfriending people. Um, I would I snooze people for about 30 days. So the snooze feature on Facebook is really awesome, especially if there's like an issue going on. So like we'll say around January 6, I had to snooze a whole bunch of people because um, I just couldn't see stuff. So if you snooze someone or unfriend them, that's one way to kind of not see it. But that's not always the best thing to do, right? Especially if it's someone who's in your inner circle and someone that you're going to be re relating with. So I think a lot of times I always have to stop and ask myself, is this going to do any good if I comment, if I point out that I think they're wrong or like give them the evidence I think is true? I, I will pause and I, I try to sit on it for like not always 24 hours, but someone once gave me the advice, like type something up, read it in 24 hours. And if you still feel that way, then maybe you could send it. And so I really tried to start practicing that in the last couple of years of, you know, I'll get really frustrated about something, but I'll type it up. And then 24 hours later, I'll come back and say, okay, is it going to do any good? And then when I reread it, I was like, oh, well, I should not send that because that's not good. So I think that's a really good practice. 
um, don't comment immediately, like sit and pause on it and then come back to it and think, okay, is it gonna do any good? Or what, what's the purpose of me commenting? What would that do? But it's hard because you see stuff and you just immediately wanna respond to it. Yeah. It's challenging. Yep. Tom asks, is there some category that people are willing to change their minds on more than others? Yeah, so great question, Tom. Uh, it used to be mind. Um, so it used to be mind was the easiest one for people to change because they could see the evidence and say, okay, well, yeah, I'm wrong. Or yeah, you provide good evidence. I think I'll switch. But I don't think that that's true anymore. I think that uh, that's not as easy. I think, you know, we don't have as many of the hand arguments, but I think those are probably the ones where people these days would probably change. Because if you're talking about what's going to, what option is going to lead to the most productive thing, people are more likely to change and go back and forth on those. So I would say, I would say hands realm would probably be like what's useful. Um, when we think about policies and procedures and things like that, that's where people tend to be able to change more easily. It's not as close to a, yeah. close to our own self. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kevin asks, are there any tips for moving from ruinous empathy to intact empathy? You talked about how ruinous empathy is really harmful, but that empathy itself is necessary. Yeah. So the ruinous empathy is just thinking, well, you know, I'm going to be really kind and not bring that up. And I don't want to cause any discomfort in the relationship. Right. Uh, so the intact empathy would be the, acknowledging that there's conflict and trying to understand the person and appreciate them for their opinion instead of avoiding the conflict, right? So that ruinous empathy is just, well, I'm not gonna address it because I don't wanna disturb my relationship or create any waves. But in, if we move to more of an intact empathy, it'd be more trying to understand and forge our relationship by understanding where they're coming from and bringing up the conflict so that you can at least understand where the other side's coming from. And that's why we try to tell conflict avoiders is like, it's not always bad. Like if you address a conflict and you're just asking the other side, like say, hey, this bothered me. And I just want to get your, a lot of times if you ask like, what's your take on this? When they explain it, you're like, oh, that wasn't how I perceived it at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's your perception that's really causing you to be angry or upset about something. And when you hear the other side, you're like, oh, well, that wasn't their intention. Their intention wasn't to do that. They didn't mean to do this. And so if we can ask those questions, then most of the time those disagreements will, you know, Kind of go away or your frustration will minimize because you just don't know that perspective until you ask about it. I think that can be really helpful um, in dealing with our kids. I um, to to talk with your your um, husband or your wife or their kids' as parent. How do you interpret what they did? And it's amazing how maybe there is a different perspective than the one I have. Um, another question, Terry. Um, well, you've talked a little bit about some attitudes, but it seems to me that there is a character of person who can have a productive disagreement versus of characters of people who can't. What kind of people do we need to try to become? So I think, you know, I always try to kind of create an environment where people can tolerate constructive criticism and realize that when you disagree, you don't hate the other person. And you don't think they're a bad person. You just don't agree with them. And I have lots of friends, probably because most of them are like debaters and academics, and we disagree on a whole bunch of stuff. But we still have really great relationships because we can, we can understand that we can have disagreements about issues, but we can still come together as friends and have conversations about other things. So I think that we want to strive to be able to handle productive disagreements, but some people... Um, are just kind of built that way, right? I am not as sensitive as some of my friends that are more of the conflict avoiders, right? Because um, they, they don't want to get into conflict. It upsets them if you, you know, say something, but I'm a little bit more direct in my communication, right? So I, that doesn't bother me as much. And so I think you try to strive to do what you can as far as productive disagreements and recognizing that just because you disagree doesn't mean you can't have a relationship with the person or your relationship's gone out the window, that that's just natural. Um, then that's a helpful approach. But it is harder for people. And it also, if you also think about extroverts and introverts, there's a lot. I'm an introvert, which I'm a weird introvert because I don't mind conflict. Most introverts don't usually like conflict, but I think that's because of my debate background, right? But if we think about introverts and extroverts, they they deal with it in different ways as well, too. So I, I think you try to do the best you can, but there are personality 
traits that just contribute or hinder kind of your ability to do that a little bit. Yeah. But acknowledging that you can learn those skills and you can practice them as well um, is important. What advice would you give? We have quite a number of faculty on this call. What advice would you give to them uh, when a, a conversation in their classroom starts to go off the rails? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, I have this thing where I always like to say, let's press the pause button. And this comes from adaptive leadership. Uh, press the pause button, kind of take the temperature of the room and you kind of see where people are at. And so when uh, something starts to derail, I'm, my students will always say, oh, she, here she goes again with the pause button. But we hit pause and I usually have them like write down something um, and we do some kind of inventory check to figure out where we are. And then I try to redirect the conversation. So sometimes it's just taking a moment, let everybody cool down, have everybody reflect personally. And maybe they don't share that with you. Maybe it's just an internal um, reflection that they do, but it allows everybody to stop and think, and then you can redirect the question, right? So I can ask a different question that's gonna take us in a different approach, um, which I teach intercultural communication. So we have these conversations all the time where especially with religion where things start to get dicey and you just have to kind of stop, redirect the conversation and ask maybe a different question that gets you to a different conversation. And Jeanette, I have a question here that someone sent me privately um, that says, I love to listen, ask questions and understand, but I don't encounter many people who feel the same. And how can you get the other person to agree to have a productive argument in a respectful way? Which I think is a great question. So. <laughs> Sometimes it's, you know, kind of just giving a disclaimer and saying like, look, you may not agree, but I want to understand where you're coming from. And usually if you couch it as I want to understand you and I want to understand where you're coming from, then people are like, oh, yeah, because they want to talk about themselves, right? They want to get mm -hmm. their opinion. They want to share that. So if you can couch it in a way that ask them like, look, I know we don't agree about this, but can you explain this to me? Or can I ask you some questions so I can understand it better? And then it's not hey, we're going to argue about this. It's I want to understand you better. And then they're going to be more likely to want to answer your questions, um, I would think. So that would be a more productive approach to try to get them to not see it as an argument, but rather I'm trying to understand about you. And then that opens the door for that conversation. You said, Terry, that anxiety triggers disagreements. And that caught my attention. Um, can you talk about that anymore? Because I think, I wonder how much of that is underlying some of the recent conflict we've seen in our nation. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think um, a lot of it, the pandemic has definitely amplified our anxieties, right? We're not having these conversations. We're not seeing people as much. There's a whole bunch of uh, examples to that. So, you know, when I have conversations with my husband, I have to think of my anxiety about like scheduling my children and making sure everybody's in the right place at the right time. Um, I kind of take on that burden. So my anxiety when someone gets sick, is like, oh no, what are we gonna do? Because I have this and this and this, but he doesn't necessarily have that same anxiety, right? So when we have these conversations, we're talking about two different things because our anxieties are completely different about that. So mm -hmm. understanding what you're anxious about influences your perspective, but it also is the driving force to why usually you feel that way. So if you can stop and ask yourself, what's my anxiety about this issue? Why am I nervous or frustrated or angry? and then ask the other person, then you're gonna see where you're approaching the issue from different ways. And that's why the disagreement's happening. And you can understand that a little bit better. If you kind of just stop and ask like, what is my anxiety and what's your anxiety about this? Like what's causing these emotions? Then you can kind of get to that, that place. Yeah, Eve noted that lots of times between ethnic groups, there's more conflict when, um, when the economic piece of the pie doesn't seem to be as big when we're yeah. all sort of competing for resources. And I, I have another question that was sent to me personally. Um, what happens when you have a person who loves to be right? Oh, that's a great question. Um, mm. I think sometimes <laughs> that's hard. That's hard. I think of my, I have a, a family member that immediately pops to mind here um, is sometimes recognizing that's just kind of their personality and realizing again when to walk away and when to say, okay, we, we can agree to disagree or you just kind of have, like there's certain things that I don't talk about with certain people because I know that they always think they're right about that. And so I just kind of don't address it, which isn't necessarily conflict avoidance. It's just, I don't allow that topic to come up because I know they're gonna go down that rabbit hole, right? So I think being able to say, okay, to listen, to understand where they're coming from and then to kind of step back and be like, okay, that's this conversation's over, or this is not, it's turned into unproductive. 
if there's not, if you're not getting anything out of it, then realizing it's turned unproductive and it's a moment to kind of step away from that conversation. Well, Terry, thank you so much. We are at three o'clock, 301. We try to stop on time too. We so appreciate, yeah, happy, thankful hands. We so appreciate your time. Um, we appreciate your expertise. We will, like I said in the chat, we have recorded this session and um, Brooke from our office is going to have it posted to YouTube. You will all get a link to that recording, uh, assuming that you signed up for the link now. And so it'll be available for you to listen again or pass on to others. And for those of you who are JCCC, Terry will also be, be developing other resources you can use. This series will continue next Wednesday at two o'clock with Hidden Gems in the Americas and uh, faculty and staff members from Canada, Colombia, and Jamaica who, have, who grew up in those countries will be telling us about their home countries. We hope that many of you can join us. Otherwise, have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us and yay for peace. <laughs>